Hey guys, this is your host, Johnny D. And this is your co-host, Brent. We just wanted to share some big news with you. The Climb Show Music Business Podcast is now a part of the American Songwriter Podcast Network. That's right. We're super excited to be part of this network along with some other amazing podcasts. So make sure you check it out at americansongwriter.com forward slash podcast or click the link in the episode notes to listen to some of the best shows in music. That's right. All right, Johnny, do your thing. Welcome to the climb. This is a show dedicated to helping singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you create leverage in the music business. Leverage is what you're going to need today to get ahead. The old school diamond in the rough where the big, big company comes and pulls you out of obscurity to make you a big star. It doesn't work anymore. Everybody's getting in. They want to know that you have a track record. They want to know that you can make the donuts and they want to know that there's an audience for the donuts that you're making. And that's called leverage. The more you have, the better deal you're going to get. That's why we called it the climb. C-L-I-M-B, creating leverage in the music business, which is brilliant. And that's a Baxter name from my good friend and co-host, Mr. Brent Baxter. Brent's an award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady Antebellum, Joe Nichols, and more. And he helps songwriters like you turn pro by revealing how you can write like a pro, do business like a pro. And on a regular basis, he connects you with the pros. You get a shot to make some relationships, which happens on the regular on this show. So uh, you can find Brent very easily at songwritingpro.com. Once again, that's songwritingpro.com. And I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Dwinnell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. They're breaking artists digitally by identifying new fans through data. Yeah, it's complicated, but thankfully... Johnny Smart. If you're an artist looking to increase your streams, blow up your video views, sell more live show tickets, and get discovered by new fans, TV, and music industry pros, then Daredevil Production can help. Daredevil has worked with multi-platinum artists like Colin Ray, Tracy Lawrence, Ty Herndon, and Andrew Griggs, just to name a few. You can find Johnny at DaredevilProduction.com. That is production, singular, no S, and there is no S because there is no other Johnny D. What's up, my brother? Hey, buddy. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm excited because I don't have to do most of the talking this time. We talk somebody into doing all the talking for us. I can't believe they keep falling for this. <laughs> I know. I love it. It's good stuff. So who are we talking to today? Yeah, today we have on special guest Courtney Gregg. She's the VP GM of Carnival Music, which is a really cool publishing company and, well, music company, really. It's not just a publishing company. It's a music company. So we're going to talk about some cool stuff they have going on. going to talk to some about the A&R process, publishing, and a pretty cool event that's coming up. So I'm stoked about it. Right on. Well, before we get into that, let's take care of a little business here. Uh, We'll give a big shout out to our good friends over at Disc Makers. It's a digital world now more than ever, right, post-COVID. But all around the country, especially indie artists, are getting back to doing live gigs. And it's an important role to have physical media at your live gigs. The digital royalty payments are so small that... When you sell products like, you know, CDs, vinyl, T-shirts, stuff like that at your gig, it's not an important income generator. It's mission critical to making sure you get to eat and get to the next town. That's right. You know, for every CD you sell at a gig, you need about 3,000 streams to make the same amount of money. Now, hey, we're all for streams. Go get them. Get as many as you can. But, man, you're leaving money on the table when you don't have merch on the table. So, thankfully, our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your disc and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even T-shirts. You can find them online at www.discmakers.com or give them a call at 800-468-9353. That's 800-468-9353. That's right. If you haven't joined the Climb community, please do so. You have to ask to be let in on Facebook here, but we let everybody in. Just be good boys and girls. We have all kinds of places for you to show off your talent. And we got songwriters connecting and creating projects, actually, that are, you know, multiple climbers getting together, which I'm super proud of. You can ask marketing questions, digital marketing questions. Whatever you got to jump over, whatever that speed bump is in front of you, ask the question in the climb community. I promise you, you're going to get a bunch of different answers that are really good. And that's on Facebook there. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you consume podcasts. Take 30 seconds and leave a rating and review. We're trying to get to 200. And most importantly, listen, we don't take this time that you spend with us on a weekly basis 
lightly. We know this is the most important asset that you have. You give us a lot of it, so you're only doing it for one reason, because you're getting something out of it. So please share that with a friend. Let them know. Another musician, another songwriter, another indie artist that you have. Hey, here's a great resource. Go make sure you got your head right, and you're playing this game the right way now, because the rules have changed, and you got to know what you're doing. And if it comes from you, it's 100% true. If it comes from us, it's 50% true, right? That's right. And I just want to share something from the Climb community real quick. We try to share these each week. This is one of the new heights. We post that every Wednesday in the climb community where members, climbers like you are encouraged to share a win, big or small. We love them all. And I just want to share one from Aaron Michael. It says, during my 5 to 7 a.m. riding block, well, first of all, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., awesome. Props. <laughs> Yeah, that's a commitment. Love it. So during my 5 to 7 a.m. writing block, I composed a funky instrumental and sold the master to a podcast for their intro that same afternoon. That sure was motivating. Well, that's motivating to me too, Aaron. So awesome. Good job. You know we are a fan of podcasts and we're a fan of songwriters. So that's a win all the way around. Good job. Nice. Congrats. Yes. Well, without further ado, let's welcome Ms. Courtney Gregg from Carnival Music. Hi, Courtney. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. So glad you can make it. I'm going to run a little bit of your bio for our climbers here listening, just so they get a better sense of who you are, and then we'll dive into some of the fun stuff. So today's guest currently serves as a VP GM for Carnival Music. She oversees the company's operations and has been instrumental in artist projects for Brent Cobb, Aubrey Sellers, Haley Witters, Eli Young Band, Roma Candle, Jed Hughes, and many others. Throughout her tenure at Carnival, she has worked with the aforementioned artist, along with guiding the songwriting efforts of Scooter Caruso, Natalie Hemby, Mark Irwin, Bruce Robison, Gretchen Peters, Troy Jones, Don Schlitz, just to name a few, and those are some strong names. Wow. During that time, the company's experienced 16 number one singles, among countless other singles, and six unique writers have celebrated their first number one single while writing at Carnival. That's got to be exciting. Our guest has handled a r duties for producer Frank Liddell on projects by Miranda Lambert, Leanne Womack, David Nell, Kelly Pickler, and others. She directs the sync efforts of Carnival, landing songs in multiple films and TV shows. She previously spent time at Zomba Music, Billboard Magazine, and ASCAP. She's co-produced the annual Americana Music Awards show at the Ryman Auditorium. She's produced the AIMP Awards, which is the independent music publishers. Done a bunch of stuff, just been around the block, and got a lot of experience and wisdom to show for it. Wow. Courtney Gregg, welcome to The Climb. Thank you so much. I feel like we shouldn't call her Courtney. We should just call her number one. <laughs> What's up, number one? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I left so much stuff out of that bio. Number one. I love it. Well, yes. the writers get the credit there. <laughs> well, it's a team effort, that that's for true. sure. And I know the writers would sing your praises mm -hmm. as well. So thank you so much for being with us, Courtney. I gave some of the bio, but it's like bio language. Sure. Can you, just for the climbers out there, can you tell us in your own words what your role is at Carnival Music? Sure. How do we do around there? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, being a small independent company, it's kind of a everyone does everything um, mentality around there, but all hands on deck. Initially, kind of started in artist development, actually, and in the studio a lot with Frank and working more on the artist side of our company, which, of course, had the songwriter element to it, but mm -hmm. then kind of added more of the publishing duties as well. So, again, kind of done everything, but... For the most part, it's working with our writers and seeing which path works best for them, whether that be a traditional songwriting path where they're just writing and they have no artist aspirations and they want to get cuts by other acts or they want to get sync placements versus most of our writers also are artists in some form or fashion. You know, some want to sell at arenas and some want to just release music online. So... It's a little bit of everything. We always say there's no blueprint with us. It's really tailored to what each individual wants to do. So that can make it challenging, but also rewarding. That's cool. The thing about small companies is you do a great job of one area. Your reward is basically, here's more stuff to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, I'm a fan of Carnival. We were talking a little bit off air that, you know, you started at Carnival the same year I moved to Nashville and, and started working at Blue Water Music. So Carnival was a client of ours. We did some admin for them at the time, and I think Blue Water still does. But I knew Blue Water was cool back around that time. I don't know if you remember this, but they put out these yellow underwear briefs that had the Carnival C on it, and it said, <laughs> we protect what's important. 
And I knew right then Carnival's awesome. So <laughs> I know I was a fan of y'all for yeah, that. Yeah, unfortunately, um, we don't have time or resources to do that anymore. But I feel like that's sorely missing from the industry right now. A little bit of fun. Right. That, <laughs> that, that was definitely fun. One thing you mentioned in your kind of telling us what you do is that a lot of your artists are writers and find the right lane for that. I'd love to dive into that a little bit because I know a lot of your writers are also artists and put out their music like Adam Wright. He puts out his own music. He also gets cuts on other artists and he's not the only one. I'm a Bruce Robinson fan. And I was looking back on his 1998 album, Wrapped, which I know is before you got to Carnival, but songs off that project were singled by George Strait, who cut Wrapped, and Tim McGraw, who had a big hit with Angry All the Time. The Dixie Chicks had a monster with Traveling Soldier off a different album. So do you think it's helpful for writers who are more like indie artists or have that ability to put out their own music? Have you seen that being a way that songs get found and picked up? Or I'm just kind of curious about that, because I know a lot of writers struggle with that. Absolutely. And funny enough, Angry All the Time, Tim McGraw had heard that on Bruce's album. And again, this is slightly before my time at Carnival, but Mm -hmm. he was just a fan and had Bruce's CD on his bus and was like, I'm going to cut that. And that was kind of in a time that that didn't happen. I feel like that's kind of in fashion right now. Writers are making their own albums, but only in the last five years has that really been a strategy, I feel like, that people are mm-hmm. necessarily employing strictly to get cuts. You know, Bruce, when he made that record, he wasn't thinking Tim McGraw's going to cut the song one day. Right. It was just kind of a happy accident. But I think it's even more proof that there's no reason not to put something out there. Saving songs anymore, you know, that's kind of, what are you saving them for? You know, you just never know <laughs> when someone's going to hear something and want to cut it and make it a big hit. Mm-hmm. Right, Travis Meadows did a lot of damage that mm-hmm. method as well. Mm-hmm, absolutely. He was on everybody's bus. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting because a lot of people ask like, oh, if this song is out there, is that going to hurt the chances of it being cut by a major artist? Should I not put it out on my own thing? So that's good to know that, hey, it's a viable strategy to do that on purpose. And hey, if you're cool enough to land on those buses, you know, your CD to land on those buses or whatever, then that can actually be a viable strategy and may not hurt you to have stuff out there because... Everything's out there these days, it seems like. So, uh, right. So that's good. I mean, with Travis Meadows, when Jake Owen cut We All Want What We Ain't Got, Mm -hmm. he called Travis and asked him if he could cut it. And of course, Travis is like, well, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But if you listen to the two tracks, I think the original one's on Killing Uncle Buzzy for Travis Meadows' record, which is a phenomenal piece of work. And you listen to what Jake Owen did. Not only did he recut it, but you can tell that he really tried to stick to the same production blueprint that Travis had, because that particular song, you didn't want anything else getting in the way of the message. It's, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's a piano vocal with some color in it, you know, from different instruments. But just from a writer's perspective, what an amazing nod, you know, you've got a big major label artist who's not only going to cut your song, but also, hey, we're going to try to cut it the same way you did. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just letting you know, you know, yeah, good music is good music, right? Exactly. And we talk a lot about that demoing and presentation of how to pitch something. And a lot of times, if you have a song like that song, or some of the songs we've had cut, you don't need the big demo, you let the song speak for itself. And in that case, it's great that Jake just kind of kept it as it was. Hats off to him for doing that. Yeah, it's flattering, you know, when you do you get something cut and you're like, oh, they liked what I did and they recognize the song as the star here. Mm-hmm. I have a quick question on that note. Let me just uh, butt in for a second. Sorry. Oh, sure. <laughs> in your mind, and I think we like to sort of gather and store opinions from all the people we get to interview on this, especially in your position in the publishing world, a good song like We All Want What We Ain't Got that just has such a strong melodic and lyrical presence that it sits all by itself, not only as a demo, as a piano vocal, but practically as the recording that was released by two different artists now. And same with The House That Built Me. You know, those kinds of songs really lend themselves to just a stripped down demo because to your words, Courtney, I think, let the song speak for itself. What songs are going to be lost, in your opinion, if they don't have a little more production on them? 
and you kind of have to know your audience too. So if we have a writer turn in a song or if a writer has a song that they feel strongly works for a certain artist or a certain type of artist, and historically speaking, we've had to really polish those songs to get them cut. We do that, but we err most of the time on the side of simple and just really, again, letting the song get out there and speak for itself. But I do think that the songs that would get lost without a demo, a lot of people are looking for tempo because if you have an artist that's a writer as well, they tend to write the ballads themselves. So when they're looking for outside songs, they're looking for the hits or they're looking for the tempos. So those are the songs that need a more proper demo or good track, which we can get into track writing if we want to. Mm -hmm. We don't have a track writer at our company because that's just not really the style of a lot of our writers. But our writers do write with track guys when that's called for. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think... It's always interesting, too. A lot of times we'll have two versions. We'll do kind of a polished demo and then our writer, maybe with even a different vocalist on it than our writer. And then we'll go and just have our writer do a guitar vocal or maybe that writer wants to release it themselves. So it's really just you kind of have to do it all these days. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's interesting, though, but I, I see that. You know, I always kind of wonder, like, if a song, let's say, we were talking about Tim McGraw before, if like Truck Yeah mm-hmm. would translate mm-hmm. as acoustic vocal, or if it needs a little more in there to get the point across where you're like, oh, this is a hit. Yeah, I can hear this. Like, do you feel that that's the case? Or Yeah, absolutely. I mean, something like that definitely needs a demo. And, and there are songs that come in, and as soon as we hear them, we're like, we got to get a really good demo on this, a really strong, loud in your face like a record basically you know let's go ahead and Mm -hmm. make it sound like a record and make it undeniable that someone needs to cut it because it's a hit all right sorry one more question on the same line of thinking you remember natalie and brulia's torn yep of course (laughs) okay and i'm sure that you probably heard i can't remember the artist's name now i'm gonna go to hell for that but the songwriter wrote it as this like slow ballad that was just tear your flesh from bone and Natalie's producer and her put tempo to it and turned it into this massive pop hit. Have you ever heard a song that came across your desk that was the ballad where you're like, man, if we ratcheted this up some BPMs, this could be a killer thing. Is that? Have you ever had that experience? Oh, yeah, that happens. I wouldn't say frequently, but it's common. A couple writers that we work with, they tend to, when they send in that work tape, It's going to be played a little slower. You know, you're just doing it in the room after the riot on your iPhone. So it's going to lend itself a little slower, whether or not that's their ultimate intention with it or not. But we hear it and we're like, okay, this is a tempo. (laughs) Like (laughs) This song is great. And ballads, I don't want to say they're easier to write, but it seems like it's more common to get ballads. So when a song does lend itself to a tempo, we really want to jump on that and say, we got to get this demoed up because that's what most people are looking for when they're looking for outside songs. Cool. So you start off more on kind of the production side, A&R side, it sounds like, and then moved over to publishing. How does that influence when you're wearing your publisher hat going, okay, this is what they're looking for. And what are some of the lessons from that as one receiving songs to now one sending songs out? And I know you still do both, but... Sure. You know, it's interesting, and I'm probably not the greatest person to ask about this because everyone Frank has worked with, even though they do cut outside songs, they're also writers themselves, Mm -hmm. especially Miranda. Obviously, most of her cuts and hits have been songs she wrote by herself, Mm -hmm. with the exception of, you know, House That Built Me and a few others. But I think that's a perfect example of someone hearing a song and even though she's a writer she's like I've got to cut this song you know George Strait made a whole career of until recently never writing any of his own music or cutting any of his own songs right Tim McGraw same way I think Alan Jackson's a great example of someone who obviously is an extraordinary writer and had Mm -hmm. hit after hit but also How many hits did he have that he didn't write? And he would go back and cover old songs. And he's such an artist, he could make it work. So, you know, it was an easy transition. But with most of the artists that have A&R for 
being writers, it almost made it easier because it took something that you knew had to just completely knock their socks off. You know, it wasn't looking to fill up a whole 10 song album where you have your slots of, okay, we need the three up tempos. We need the three ballads. We need this or that, you know, it was more Mm -hmm. of really looking for the best songs out there because if Miranda had a 12 song album, she was going to write 10 of those. So the two Mm -hmm. that made it through that she didn't write had to be something super special. And just to give you a couple stories, we had a song that sat in our catalog. I think the song was written in 97. So it was well before I was at Carnival. And it had just been kind of a favorite around the office. And Frank was getting a batch of songs to send her. And I was like, send her this one. And he's like, yeah, I should. And there'd been other artists through the years that came close to cutting it. But Mm -hmm. it was kind of quirky. And again, at this point, I think it was 2000. 10 or 11 and the song was written in 97 so a lot of times you don't Mm -hmm. get songs cut that are that old especially with an outdated demo and things like that (laughs) and so he sent her the song and she cut it and then it was a single and it's a song called all kinds of kinds oh yeah and it kind of went on to be an anthem and you know that's just like a proud moment you know when you see a song through (laughs) it was probably 15 years old when it got cut around that wow those bruce songs Angry All the Time, Traveling Soldier, mm-hmm. Desperately, Wrapped. Those were all at mm-hmm. least 10 years old when they got cut as well. So we don't give up on songs. <laughs> if it's... Clearly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it's a special song, it's a special <clears throat> song. So It's not even like it's your baby. It's your teenager. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, you're like, you know the kid. The, the song is old enough to drive. <laughs> right. Well, if you're like my kids, it's like, okay, what are we going to do to get this kid out of the house? <laughs> so sounds like that's actually great. We're talking about going, okay, Miranda's you know going to write 10. We're only looking for two, so it has to be something that's just a world beater. I think that's a great training for what is going on right now, at least in the commercial country market, is so many artists are writing their own stuff. Mm -hmm. Their name's on most everything. So what maybe at the time or when Miranda was starting out wasn't as common for the artist to be writer on most everything is kind of the norm now that the artist is writing most of the stuff. So that's what they're looking for are those cream of the crop songs that really break through. And I know a lot of writers can kind of get where the bar is messed up because they listen to the what's on the radio and that sort of thing. And they go, oh, well, my stuff is just as good as that. Not realizing that, yeah, but your name's not the right name. You're not the artist. You didn't write it yourself. You're not kind of in the camp. And your songs got to go into a different stack where they only pick maybe one or two Mm -hmm. off an album and not the eight or nine. Right. And that's a very different process, very different bar for that. Super competitive. Because exactly. they're not just picking what they love out of their stuff and what works for them, which are some still some amazing songs. They're no slouches either, you know, most of these artists that are writers. But then to get one of those outside ones, that's a much different deal. And so I just want to encourage all the climbers not to be fooled <laughs> by <sighs> what's on the radio, even though there's some amazing stuff on the radio that is where the bar is. But also knowing that unless you're writing with the artist or you are the artist, it's a different game sometimes. Yeah, I think that's great insight on that. Now, a couple of questions before we move into some other topics, but working on kind of the A&R side or publishing side, you know, where songs are coming in from outside writers, people trying to get on your radar, trying to get on a project or as a writer, what are some landmines that you see writers stepping on when submitting songs, either for publishing consideration or cut consideration? What are some common mistakes you see maybe writers making? And kind of two categories. One is submission mistakes, just going about sending the song in, in Mm -hmm. a uncool way. And the other is like song mistakes, where the problem is the song itself. Okay, sure. You notice some themes in those mistakes? <laughs> well, There's some comments, some, some usual suspects. <laughs> <Right>, exactly. <laughs> we actually, I don't want to say have an open door policy because we don't advertise that, but mm-hmm. you know, a lot of companies won't even listen to anything unsolicited for mm-hmm. legal reasons. And a lot of right. writers don't understand that. They think, you know, the guys at the publishing company are just being jerks. So you won't listen to my stuff. Yeah. I can explain that legal stuff really quick. The odds of them finding a lawsuit in unsolicited material is a lot better than the odds of them finding a hit. Exactly. (laughs) So we will occasionally, again, it helps if someone 
drops a name of someone I know or a lot of the times where we tend to listen or find new writers are through our current roster people that they're writing with. Mm -hmm. So our writers don't always write with other published writers. You know, sometimes they write with unpublished writers and Mm -hmm. a lot of times they'll turn in songs that we really like with that, you know, unpublished writer. And so we start taking meetings with that person. It sounds old fashioned, but I still think that the PROs, ASCAP, BMI and CSAC, you know, starting there, if you're someone that just moved to town, Mm -hmm. they're pretty good at vetting new writers, young writers to see if they're ready to start taking publishing meetings. Mm -hmm. And not only if you're ready, but also where you fit, because we're obviously a certain type of publishing company, Mm -hmm. but there are other companies that do 180 degrees from what we do. So you probably wouldn't send the same writer to us and company X, you know? So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I know an unpublished writer wants to meet with as many publishers as they can, but also if if it's not a good fit, it's really not the best use of anyone's time, you know? And so there's a nuance. Yeah, there's a nuance. So that's still a big source. If a PRO sends me an email to ask me to meet with someone, I never say no because Mm -hmm. we have such a good relationship with all of them and I trust their ears and I trust that they're not going to send me someone that's a waste of my time. So as far as the submissions, I would say going that route or even NSAI or I've had people look on LinkedIn and see that I was linked in to someone else and <laughs> and then yeah. have that person reach out to me, that kind of stuff. But just a cold email, you're probably not going to get it open mm-hmm. and listen to. It's just really tough. Again, going back to the legal reasons too, but mm-hmm. on top of it, just how busy everyone is, it's not probably going to get listened to. So finding a way, a foot in the door, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then as far as what songs, you know, it's tough because you don't want to be critical because some people don't have the budget to do demos Mm -hmm. or do a good sounding recording of the song. So all they have is their iPhone work tape. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to say, well, everyone needs to go demo songs before they come have a publisher meeting. But it is nice to have one or two songs that kind of give you a feel of what the writer does that are in something a little more substantial than a work tape. Mm -hmm. And a big pet peeve of mine (laughs) for anyone listening who does get a publishing meeting is a lot of times I'll get a link ahead of the meeting that has three to five songs on it. Mm -hmm. And then the writer comes in the room to meet with me, say I like it enough to have a meeting with them. And they come in And I ask them to play something live and they play me the same three to five songs. (laughs) And Mm. I get it that obviously they think those are their strongest songs. But I always have to say, you know, I already listened to these on the link. Do you have something else that you can play me? Because (laughs) if you only have five songs, you're not going to get a publishing deal off of five good songs. Right. You know, unless they're Bob Dylan level. (laughs) But, (laughs) But yeah, so that's a little advice I would give people is keep an ace in the hole, keep something in your back pocket to play when you actually get in the room. It doesn't have to be your strongest song because obviously you want to put that in the link that you're sending to get the meeting, but hold something that's a little bit different, whether it's a 100% song or something that goes over well live in your shows or just don't play the same songs that you put in the link. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, that's great advice. Good to know. And that's a personal preference, but I would say a lot of people probably feel that way. Yeah, I think that's great because, you know, it's one thing if they don't know if you've listened yet or whatever, but they know you've heard, then definitely come prepared with something else. And like you said, if you only have like three to five songs that are worth playing for a publisher, you're not ready yet. You Mm -hmm. need to go write more songs. Right. For sure. Yeah. Here's your chance as a writer to lay out a deep cut. Like you said, something that just is a big hit at the live shows that, you know, maybe wouldn't be a single or something like that, but it's your chance to show the artistry, to show what you're doing and show some depth. Maybe it's got a better lyric, Mm -hmm. you know, a little bit deeper lyric because now you like the first five songs enough to get the meeting and let them in the door. And now it's time to let me learn a little bit more about you, you know, and what else you got? Right. And writers tend to put on a link if they have written with any published writers or any kind of name writers, they want you to know that. So they Mm -hmm. put that on their link 
you know, I wrote this one was blah, 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 and this one was blah, 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 so that you can see that they didn't just roll in the town. You know, they, they have some connections, which is great. Mm -hmm. But then in the room, again, I like to hear a song that you wrote by yourself or, like you said, something that has a little more meat to it, just to see that it's there. Even... Even if you do only have those three to five songs, just the potential and a lot of initial meetings with a writer don't always lead to publishing deals, but they usually lead to co-writes. You know, I'll set you up with, mm -hmm. you know, I think you would work well with these three writers at our company. Or have you met with so-and-so? I think you would work better over there than with us, you know, that kind of thing. Kind of what I'm picking up from this, too, is you're not just looking for hit songs. You're looking for hit writers. You're looking for the writer mm -hmm. as much or more than you're looking for the song. Like you said, that's why you care. Okay, what do you do by yourself? What's some other stuff? Because you're interested in who are you and what do you bring to the table? It's great if you wrote a song with whoever, whatever hit writer, and it sounds awesome. And there's value to that for sure. But is that only because you're in the room with that person? Can you do that with unknown writers? Can you do that with our writers? Can you do that by yourself? I'm looking for a writer, not just some songs. Exactly. It's kind of what I'm hearing from that. Yeah, because there are people who have definitely got publishing deals by who they've written with and had hits, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, by just being the third person in the room. And, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways it's like, good for you <laughs> if you found a way to do that. <laughs> right. But that's yeah. not what we're looking for. You know, we're looking for someone that will stand the test of time and, again, have those songs that we pull up 15 years from now and kicked up by someone. So... That's right. And talking about publishing companies kind of having different nuances and different kind of vibes. I remember when I started at Blue Water Music, I was in the admin department. I was in the office side, not the creative side. Mm -hmm. But I remember Brownlee Ferguson, the owner. I'm sure you've met. Oh, yeah. If you met him, you know it. So <laughs> he had talked about for Blue Water because Blue Water, you know, is compatible with Carnival. Definitely different writers and stuff, but a boutique. You know, we had mm -hmm. writers like Jim Lauderdale. Chris Knight, Kim Ritchie, not your like straight ahead mainstream. They are artists as well as a lot of like carnival writers are. They're artists. And he said, we can't go head to head with like Sony ATV on songs. If they want the straight ahead mainstream, obvious radio stuff, they're going to go there because mm -hmm. they're huge. They have the leverage relationships. He goes, our thing is going to be that boutique where you come for the different stuff. You can't get Jim Lauderdale songs anywhere else. You want a Jim Lauderdale song, you're coming to Blue Water. Because you can't get Jim Lauderdale songs just anywhere. And that's sort of the same thing with like Bruce Robison or Adam Wright or, you know, all these different people that y'all have. It's like, OK, you want that kind of thing? You come to us. And there's a leverage in that. So right. it seems like just from the outside looking in that Carnival's been intentional. Like Scooter Crusoe, you're not just getting those anywhere. Right. <laughs> those don't grow on trees. That is a very specific, <laughs> amazing thing that he does. And it's like, OK, come on to us. Right. Yeah. You pretty much nailed it. I mean, that's kind of how we've set up our company. I mean, currently, Scooter's no longer with us, but Brent Cobb is a good example of someone we're working with right now. And, you know, Brent's having his own success as an artist and recording artist and touring artist, and that's great. But he's also just really crushing it on the writing side of things. I mean, he's had so many cuts by major label acts mm -hmm. and... Coming up, he's got one on Luke Bryan's album that's coming out this month and awesome. Keith Urban's new record. And, you know, he's had Kenny Chesney cuts, Miranda cuts, Little Big Town. He's had a lot. <laughs> but yeah, that's awesome. They kind of stand out on the album. You know, I'm biased, but, you know, I think <laughs> that they definitely have, you know, you're like, oh, what's this? It's kind of different than the rest of the album, you know? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, right now, he hasn't had a radio single yet on an outside cut. But we feel like it's close. I feel like we don't have trouble getting Brent in the room with people. People are starting to know what he does and they want it. You know, they want to write with mm -hmm. Brent. So, you know, that's kind of like you were talking about the Lauderdales. You know, once people caught on to Lauderdale, they're like, I need some of this guy. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. he's not your run-of-the-mill writer, but I definitely need him. That's great. And I think that's a smart strategy these days is like, what can you do to not be a commodity? Mm -hmm. That way you leverage the actual art 
a little bit more. And it's one of those things maybe with Brent Cobb about where all you need is that one artist to go ahead and say, yeah, let's put this out as a single. And if it does well, it kind of gives everybody else permission to do that as well. Exactly. You know, we are a little bit of a you go first kind of <laughs> business a little bit. What does it say? Settlers get homes, pioneers get arrows. You go be the pioneer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess for Lauderdale, it was probably straight. He had a few yeah. cuts before that, but I think George was the first one that really put him in the mainstream. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So awesome. Nice. Let's talk a little bit about the Thriving Roots Music Conference, because that's, yeah. that's one thing we reason we want to have you on today and talk about that. I'll give a little stuff on it, but you can go in depth. On September 16th through 18th this year, so 2020, Thriving Roots is a virtual community music conference. And so it's brought together by the Americana Music Association, I guess. Can you tell us a little bit about what's coming up and what people can expect from it? And I see that it's online, it's virtual, which is appropriate for the world we're living in these days. (laughs) Correct. Unfortunately, the time we're living in prohibits a lot of the in-person gatherings that we're accustomed to, but I feel like the team has really put together something special here that has some unique conversations and unique things that might not have even happened in the in-person conference. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a combination of workshops, conversations, and your traditional panels But I think the thing that's most unique about it is going to be these conversations, these interviews, kind of styled after the masterclass. I don't know if you guys have watched that, but where someone just kind of does a deep dive into what they do. Mm -hmm. I've been down that rabbit hole for lighting (laughs) and for cinematography (laughs) lately. Like, I'm 15 hours in to the masterclasses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm well aware. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so, you know, just kind of getting a little more out of it than you're... 30 minute panel and there will be panels and you know those are super informative as well but this new kind of idea of some of the ones that are already confirmed and there's several more in the works that we can't announce yet but Jackson Brown will be talking having a conversation with Mavis Staples Amy Lou Harris nice. and Ken Burns are going to talk about his documentary country music and kind of looking back on what's happened since it was released a year ago. Um, Brandy Carlisle and Yola are going to have a conversation about quote unquote overnight success, you know, which we all know is a a myth. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And again, there are some more that we can't necessarily discuss right now, but you know, Mm. other people that will be involved are T-Bone Burnett and Roseanne Cash and Mary Goucher, there's a lot of high-level names here, and even some names that in the coming weeks I think will turn a lot of heads of what we're trying to do here. And one of the neat things about this conference, too, is a lot of people come to Americana Fest every year, and they like to get together with their friends that they only see once a year. And so Mm -hmm. we wanted to ensure that that element wasn't missed. So there is going to be a platform there where you create your own profile and you go into these rooms with people and have a video chat and private messaging and discussion forums. In between the conversations and the panel, there are going to be little music segments, you know, while you're waiting. If you are watching it live, you know, which you don't have to, if you register, you Mm -hmm. can watch the content because obviously if three things are going on at the same time, we don't want you to have to pick which one you're going to choose, which is another benefit of this. Because if it was in person, I mean, I've spoken on panels the last couple of years and I've had to miss panels that I wanted to go listen to because I was speaking, about, you know. <laughs> right. So with this setup, you don't have to miss anything, which is another great aspect of it. I love that. I never thought about yeah. that. That's cool. The staff did a great job of turning what could have been a real bummer into something that I think is super special and, you know, could possibly continue past this year, even when the conference comes back. Because this is presented by the Americana Association along with the Americana Foundation, which is a new thing that just launched this year. So it could stand alone as its own thing as well. I think that's so smart because I've wondered about that as well with conferences. You know, I was supposed to be a, one of the key teachers at NSAI's song camp or advanced mm-hmm. camp, one or the other, like last week at the time of this recording. Of course, it didn't make it through COVID. And I've been wondering so much a draw of live events like this is people ducking out of the panels and stuff to go get coffee and donuts and talking to people. All the stuff that happens in the hallway is a lot of times so valuable and sometimes the sole reason why people go. 
And so I'm, I'm glad to hear that y'all have acknowledging that reality and going, okay, how can we bring some of the hallway online for people to meet and have that? Cause it's so important. That was definitely one thing that the staff identified pretty early on that if we're doing it this way, we have to make sure that attendees have the chance to network with other attendees and with panelists and just really get that element of it. Yeah. Because that's the one thing you can't just YouTube, you know, you can't just YouTube Jackson Brown (laughs) and you're going to find a lot of great stuff, but Mm -hmm. you're not going to find that connection. And so I think that's imperative just in the world we live in for artists, for everything as we're pivoting into this kind of new world, which who knows how long it'll be here or this may just be a thing we have to have ready to go whenever one of these incidents happen to go, okay, how can we bring this personal kind of stuff online that people can't just get again not being a commodity yeah because information is somewhat commoditized but relationship isn't exactly but dang though you know mavis staples and jackson brown those some of those conversations just sound like they're going to be amazing those are great folks so yeah i think it's great you know again you just never know you get the spur of the moment two superstars sitting there you know bantering with each other of what could come out and then Mm -hmm. that coupled with what we talked about with the networking element and then these kind of workshops like Mary Goucher is going to do a songwriting workshop and the anatomy of a publicity campaign Mm -hmm. it's kind of going to be a little bit of everything for you know it didn't want to be one note so I think Mm -hmm. it's coming together really well and I'm really looking forward to it that's awesome so if people want to find more out about the Thriving Roots conference, where can they go? They can go to the Americana Music Association page. And right now, passes are still $99 at the time of this. And so they'll go up mm-hmm. soon by $50. So I think they go up to 149 But I think it's well worth it. Even if you just networked for $99, it's worth it, you know. It's a lot cheaper than most any plane ticket you're going to find in Nashville, especially considering there's People aren't gathering too much right now. So right. yeah. no hotel rooms, no airplane exactly. tickets. You can have cocktails at home. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Less expensive and get to work. I think that's amazing. Mm-hmm. What I think is interesting, it mentions on here is, since it's also timely, topics like the use of music and political campaigns. Because I know every four years that becomes a thing about <laughs> somebody's using a song and some artist is ticked off about it. So that's one of those that keeps relevant, especially every four years, like the year they're in right now. So I think that alone would be worth checking out for artists to go, yeah, what are my rights in this and what can they do with my music? So I think that's going to be interesting as well. But John, do you have any questions about the conference or anything with Courtney? I know we're getting on time here. No, I think we covered everything. Courtney, any big releases that you can tell us about for Carnival that's coming out in the next 30 to 60 days that we need to look for? Um, Yeah, we have a couple of things. A guy that we work with, Waylon Payne, he's releasing an album. He's already released some music from the album. He's kind of doing it in acts of three songs. So there's Mm -hmm. four acts total for 12-song album, but that's out on September 11th. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then Brent Cobb has his new album out on October 3rd. And then Adam Wright has a new project out October 9th, I believe. And a lot of other things. Aubrey Sellers has been releasing some covers. You know, a lot of people in the studio, a lot of people releasing singles. You just kind of have to keep content out there. That's one thing these days. I feel like you can't go too long without getting something out there. Mm-hmm. I also am not a fan of sticking a song out every week <laughs> and not promoting <laughs> it. Like you have to give something a little bit of breathing room. Yes. You know, I personally wouldn't recommend putting out anything more than once a month. Again, you're just kind of killing your last release if you put something out right on top of it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, if you go more than three months these days, unless you're just really a huge act and you're working on an album and that's kind of what people are used to, but... I would say a three to four month kind of rotation or cycle of getting music out feels pretty good. And speaking of Waylon Payne, by the way, I loved him in Walk the Line. So, John, he played Jerry Lee Lewis in Walk the Line, which I got the DVD sitting downstairs. But he was awesome. Yeah, he was great. Uh, Nobody follows the killer. So, good stuff. (laughs) Oh, I love that. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah, it was awesome. It? It's a great movie. So, Courtney, thanks so much for being with us today and being our guest here and sharing your insights. It's, yeah, thank you for having me. It's fun. It's good to talk off the air too a little bit about some mutual friends and you know some connections there. I got to meet Adam right around the same time you and I probably met because uh, mm-hmm. you know he had songs on that Alan Jackson project that Aaron and I were on, and so we got to bump into each other some stuff too. So, tell Adam I said howdy next time you see him. But I certainly will. Thank you so much for being here and just kind of helping our artists and writers on their climb, on their musical journey. And best of luck with the Thriving Roots Conference. It sounds like it's going to be amazing. So I just want to encourage all the climbers out there to go check that out at the Americana Music Association webpage. They can go and get all the details linked through from that. But thank you so much for being here. This is great. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it so much. All right, yeah, nice to meet you, Courtney. That brings us to the end of another Killer Climb episode. Make sure that you subscribe to the podcast wherever you consume podcasts. Join the Climb community. Leave a rating and review. We're trying to get to 200. And tell a friend about it. We got some great value bombs here on this interview with Courtney Gregg. And, you know, once again, the Thriving Roots virtual conference on September 16th to 18th is going to be a big deal. This podcast exists because we want you to win, so keep on climbing. And we'll see you at the top. Ooh.